Could we have the roll call by the town clerk, please? Chairman Swift Hayata. Here. <laughs> Councilor Backer. Present. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor Lynch. Present. Councilor McGinty. Here. Councilor Mole. Here. Councilor Roberts. Present. Manager McGovern. Here. And our town clerk, Ms. Cabana. Here. Great. Thank you very much. Pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Um, reports and correspondence. Do any counselors have anything they would like to report on? It's a slow step. Well, it's not a report okay. so much as Councilor a Lynch? suggestion and a request. I keep reading in the newspaper that the state chamber and the local chambers are in a quandary about um, what position they should take, if any, on the um, tax cap, the Pileski. Uh, referendum and um, I was thinking that it might be in order for the council um, to um, communicate with their local chamber and at least let them know what the impact um, on the town would be should it be enacted um, and perhaps providing them with information such as the information that um, is coming out of our citizens advisory group might be helpful in assisting them in making up their minds on which side of the um, equation they want to be on. Thank you. Um, we are going to be um, briefly discussing in, in workshop at the end of this meeting um, um, an update on the Pileski tax cap and perhaps if other counselors want to discuss this idea further we could do, do that then. If there is discussion. Are there any Yes, Council Mole. Yes, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that helped organize, put on, and participated in Cape Elizabeth Family Fun Day. Uh, we had a great time. We got lots of people to come out. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was with regards to tax relief, uh, as Councillor Backer has mentioned in the past and other councillors had mentioned, at some point we ought to consider possibly some formal uh, language or statement to the town that as we get tax dollars back from the school referendum tax, the school funding referendum that was passed this spring that some of the tax benefits that we get back from that, we let our uh, residents know that we're going to send that on as tax relief. Yes, and I would um, remind you that uh, the town council goals for which I've asked, I've sent a draft out to everyone and need to get your input back, but uh, part of one of the subheads under the town council goal number one is to pass a resolution that the additional net state revenue resulting from question one will go towards property tax relief. So I thank you for that um, reminder. Yeah. And also we've received a copy of what Portland is considering and, and um, I had volunteered to take a look at that and revise it yeah. if, if it needs revision um, so that it could be on an August or September agenda. Thank you. Councilor Roberts. You looked this way once before and I didn't think about it, but before I came over I was briefly watching uh, 207 on the, on the news and one of our Cape residents, Maya Cohen, was uh, there with the police looking for additional volunteers for the Beach to Beacon race. I think there are about 300 volunteers shot. Uh, they're looking for folks to man the water stations and the medical tent and the, uh, traffic control and all of those type of issues. So if there's anybody that would be interested in getting involved, uh, WCSH had a website that would link it. I think it's beach2beacon.com that you can reach them at as well. And this race is really important to the town. It's a great asset. So we need to get the volunteers out there. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, further reports or correspondence? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I missed last, I had the rare occasion last month of missing the council meeting. And so, therefore, I'd like to thank Deborah Lane for uh, handling everything uh, in my absence. I'd like to uh, congratulate Marianne Lynch. I wasn't here for her last meeting. 
and want to say I really enjoyed working with her as, as chairman, and uh, it was uh, an awful lot happened last year, and appreciate uh, uh, all your efforts in trying to have everyone work together and serve together. So thank you. Pleasure was mine too, Michael. Thank you. Like I say, I look forward to working with you, Anne, and uh, <laughs> with Pilesky, it could be a very interesting year. Ah, uh, yes, ah, uh, we'll, yes. We'll see about, we'll see how that evolves. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a very interesting article in the, on our town's webpage uh, about Lisa Petroselli and the, com the community pool having won something called the Spirit of Goodwill Award. Mm -hmm. And if anyone really wants to feel good about their community and the folks who work for them, uh, they need to read this story about Lisa and all of the folks, not just Lisa, but the folks who work at the pool, as well as people who are at the pool, and you know, the, the citizens there and the very welcoming feeling that they give to folks uh, with disabilities. It's, it's a great story and it's a award well deserved by Lisa, uh, who unfortunately will be leaving us this month uh, after uh, having been at the pool uh, practically since its opening at the fitness center, since its opening now. She's accepted a job, a position as the head uh, soccer coach at the uh, State University of New York in Potsdam, where she'll be beginning work soon. So thank her for all her services, congratulate her on the award, and uh, wish her well. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, a time period that we have for citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. So if there's any citizen of Cape Elizabeth present who would like to come forward and speak, please come to the podium. Seeing not, uh, oh, sir, no, I saw a hand go up, but I think that was for someone else. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, next is the minutes. Do I hear a motion? The minutes of our previous meeting. Move approval of the minutes of June 14th. Second. Um, I, if I would make two corrections on the um, four, page four, and I've also already told the town clerk about these, so she's already captured these, but just for everyone else. On page four, item number eight, uh, it was had to do with the appointment of the representative and alternate to Greater Portland Council of Governments General Assembly, and um, it should read ordered that the town council ordered the town council that Carolyn Fritz is the town of Cape Elizabeth representative to Greater Portland Council of Governments General Assembly, not Executive Committee, because that is Councilor McGinty's position, and that Jack Roberts will serve as alternate of said assembly not committee. And then the other one is on page seven. At the bottom of the page, it's not really an item number, it was item number 130405, um, the very last paragraph there. It says, moved by uh, J. Roberts and seconded by M. Mole, ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council table item 130405 until July 12th, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there was no vote recorded there. It's not on the next page. And it, as I recall, and I think the, the clerk confirmed, it was a seven yes vote on that. So I would just offer those as um, corrections to the minutes. Any other discussion or corrections? I'd like to offer two small corrections. In the reports and correspondence on the first page, the very first item notes that Councilor McGinty, McGinty recently attended a meeting of the Greater Portland Council of Governments and noted that there was a reduction of 5% in their budget. I don't think that's quite what um, Councilor McGinty uh, was relaying to us, but rather that there will be a dues reduction of 5% for Cape Elizabeth and other municipal members of the Greater Portland Council of Government. That's correct. Thank you. And um, was there another correction? The only other um, correction that I'd like to note is at the top of page two, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. There's a reference to the presentation made by David Sawyer um, of South Portland um, commenting on items that he felt the council should know regarding the Maine Supreme Court's recent reversal of the Blueberry Ridge subdivision. Um, the Supreme Court didn't actually reverse 
the Blueberry Ridge subdivision. What it actually did was reverse um, the planning board's approval of the Blueberry Ridge subdivision. So just for accuracy, for anybody who might read these minutes um, in the future, I'd like to have it refer to reversal of the planning board's approval of uh, the Blueberry Ridge subdivision. That, that's important. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. I agree with you. It's really important that we um, make sure the minutes are correct because I know sometimes we have to go back and refer to the minutes much later and we want just want to make sure they're accurate so when we try to reference them later we know what we're talking about. Any other corrections? I don't want to belabor this. Was it a, re was it a remand or, or reverse? Um, actually to be accurate I believe it was a remand. So it should read the recent remand? What For the yeah. town clerk just so. Okay. I suppose it could be a reversal and remand, which is really what they did. Okay, reversal and remand. They hit it back to us. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay, let's move the question. All those in favor for approving the minutes as, as corrected? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, the um, next item on our agenda has to do with parking on Fenway Road. Um, we will be having a public hearing having to do with, um, well, the, the item, item number 23 is consideration of striking section 13-2-3Q of the Code of Ordinances, um, and it, which has to do with uh, parking on which sides or both sides or no sides of um, Fenway Road. So now is an opportunity for anyone uh, to come forward and to give us your thoughts and comments on this issue. I would ask that you come to the podium, please, if you have something to say so that people at home can hear you on the microphone. And please state your name and address and please try to keep your remarks brief. So anybody who would like to speak, please come forward. Yes, ma'am. My name is Joyce. I live at 2 Fenway and for the next week I've been there for 22 years. Just briefly, that um, I don't see a problem on parking on both sides of Fenway. Um, I don't think we abuse it. We use it when we have friends and company. Um, Great Pond is there and yes, it should be used by everybody. My poor kids used it. I'm not having anybody of that it's an educational thing and I just believe that parking on both sides of Fenway should be something that we should be able to have as a neighborhood. Um, we shouldn't be banned from parking in front of our home. I don't feel as though my company should park across the street and block somebody else's little company. So just wanted to restress that I am twenty two years I don't really know the problem parking on both sides of the road. It's the freedom we have I'd like to have it back. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, ma'am. Anyone else? Yes, sir, please come forward. <coughs> My name's Fred Brown. I live on 16 Fenway Road, the last house down on the right. Uh, I was never so pleased in my life when my town council voted that no parking on one side of the street. I live down on the end. And with the town and the conservation committee and everybody trying to promote Great Pond, which I do not have a problem with, uh, the problem I do have is the fact that they all come down and they park just before they get to my house on both sides of the street. And some people say that's not a problem. On three different occasions, I've had to call the police department so I can get home. There is a state law that states that you have to have 10 feet. Well, the pavement of Fenway Road is only 23 feet wide. My particular pickup truck and most of them are about six and a half feet wide. You take six and a half and six and a half and you end up with 13 feet. That's giving you just the 10 feet you need. That is if the tires uh, break up against the people's grass. 
which does not happen all the time. And then during the winter, when snow plows come down and they plow, the street is even narrower than that. And I just like to have the security after living here for 30 some odd years to know that if something happens to my wife or the grandchildren, maybe my house catches on fire, the emergency vehicles can get down the street. If the house catches on fire and that truck, fire truck can't get down the street, it's too late to call a tow truck to tow off a vehicle. That and the other thing is, is if there are vehicles on both sides of the street, the street is narrower than what it's supposed to be, and those vehicles can be towed, which one was in the wrong? That's all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Please come forward. Town Manager Michael from the Governor, Madam Chairwoman, Councilors, my name is Frank Bullen. I've been a resident of Fenway Road since January of 1972. My two children grew up here, and my wife and I both reside at 11 Fenway Road. In 32 plus years, I've never experienced a problem with my automobile of either going up the street or coming back down the street and returning to my home. Over a number of years, because of the problems from time to time at Great Pond, the fire department, the rescue squad has been there, as well as the police department. Unknown or not to my knowledge, it has been a problem for the police department, the rescue squad, or the fire department. They've been there many times. A few, back in early June of this year, I had the privilege of calling on a lot of my neighbors on Fenway Road, and we have some residents who have lived there since 1961. That's 43 years. And I asked some of them if they had any problems in their 43 years of living on Fenway Road, and their answer was no. That's a long time, 43 years, a pretty good track record. I also understand that our street and width is commensurate to most residential streets in our town. And if that is true, then why should, why should we have a problem here with parking on both sides of the street? Um, I feel a great pond will grow because people are going to be able to use it 12 months of the year. And I've experienced um, uh, periods of time that I wasn't very happy about it. People pack on the lawn and other problems that go with it. As the traffic increases to the area, you incur more problems. I also feel very strongly in this great town that we all live in, that no residential area should have to become a parking area or a recreational area. And I think this is wrong, and I, I'm just throwing it out to you people this evening. Why Fenway Road? Why not a nice public parking area for our residents? so they can really go and enjoy Great Pond. It's a beautiful area, nature at its best. Why not put it to good use? It needs to be taken out of the residential areas and put into the non-residential areas of our town. As I said earlier, I had the privilege of calling on a number of my neighbors, along with another neighbor, and the total number of homeowners who are affected by the present ordinance that restricts parking to one side of the street has an impact on 14 homeowners. And we don't want it. All 14 residents have signed it. 14 for 14. The other two homeowners live in the cul-de-sac area, and therefore they're not affected by it. But we are, 
and it's going to cause burdensomes for families that have a lot of friends and family and relatives. Where are they going to park? I hope after this evening that this parking situation on Fenway Road is taken out of the residential areas of our town, along with Fenway Road, and put into the non-residential areas in our town. That's where it belongs. Thank you. Thank you yep. very much, sir. Excuse me, Madam, Madam Chairwoman. Yes. Could I Councilor ask Beck. the gentleman to come back to the podium so I can make sure that I understand the full import of some of what you told us? Yes. I, and I'm sorry, would, would you tell me your last name? Fulham, F-U-L-H-A-N, Thank you. I'm sorry, I just didn't catch your last name no when you said it the first time. Mr. Fulham. Um So you'd like to see us remove the ban on parking on one side, restore parking to both sides of the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. But at the same time, am I hearing you say that you would like us to find a separate place for people to park to access Great Pond. Do you have a suggestion as to where that should be? Back in May, I, I excuse, excuse me, sir. If you could just go to the podium. Back in May of this year, I wrote a letter. My wife and, uh, my wife and I were both away at the time. And I um, stopped in the library where we were, and I mailed a letter. And in that letter, I incorporated that. And in fact, one of my neighbors is going to discuss that uh, area as his suggestion for the non-residential area and to take the uh, public parking off the residence. He's going to discuss that. It, I can tell you where it is, but I <laughs> okay. let him have his say. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm Jim Hughes, and I live on 10 Fenway Road. And I want to thank you for taking this up promptly. I happened to see David Backer on the swimming pool and mentioned this issue, and he said, email him, and town government is, is works very promptly and very responsive. Um, I also uh, urge the council to repeal that ordinance and allow parking on both sides of the road. <coughs> Um, Frank mentioned a few reasons, and um, this 14 out of 16 people on the road that signed the petition, there were actually a total of 26 people that signed it, and it was forwarded to you folks. I have a copy here in case you uh, don't have it. But the only two houses that did not sign it are those that live in the cul-de-sac, as Frank Fulham pointed out. Um, and in the cul-de-sac, there is no parking. And we're not seeking to have parking in the cul-de-sac. So it is unanimous. Every person that is affected by this ordinance wants it repealed. The, um, this solution does cause problems. Uh, for example, Mr. Fulham is very meticulous with his lawn beautiful and doesn't want people parking there and littering his lawn with beer cans and cigarette butts. My lawn is not so so nice and so I don't mind people parking at uh, my side but my side is the one that is affected by this ordinance and his side is the one that mandates parking and it also means I can't even have any guests over. That means my guests would have to park in front of somebody else's house for any social thing. And it, it, it's not right. Um, also, there are a number of signs along Fenway Road, uh, wooden markers. And I suspect that those are going to be for potential signs that say no parking. And I don't want Fenway Road looking like Congress Street and having uh, many no parking signs in front of my house, which is what it will look like. The people who use Fenway Road, uh, Great Pond, are not asking for this. They're content. 
And uh, if people I have guests that want to use it, park in front of my house and, um, and they'll do it. And it is true that this, this road actually, I grew up on Ocean View Road part of my life, is much uh, narrower than Fenway Road. And yet there's no call for parking there, uh, bands like this. Um, Fenway Road is fairly wide, and uh, there have been no problems, as far as I know, with uh, fire or police. And they seem to only come at night when people are gone anyway. So it's uh, never been a problem, as far as I know. So in the, uh, in the short run, we residents, um, those who are affected this are asking that um, this be repealed. In the long run, as Frank mentioned, um, perhaps there are other solutions to this problem. We know that the Sprague people are taxed a lot, and yet there are some property they own, and this is to just throw out, I haven't researched it at all, but perhaps there's a road that can go from the 77 sign uh, between the Grange Hall and Crescent Beach. Perhaps there's a road that can go into Great Pond from there where there are no houses and perhaps there can be a quid pro quo perhaps for the spray in terms of getting tax refund or something like that. But it seems to me that uh, if there was such a road that was not in a residential area, that would have a less burdensome impact on us who live there. So, in sum, uh, we ask that you repeal, and I ask that you repeal this. We all want our residents to enjoy Great Pond. It's beautiful. Uh, I was out in my garden uh, yesterday with my son, and a great big blue heron uh, flew by. And we've had moose in the yard, and we see the red-winged blackbirds, and, and the geese are beautiful. But we ask that it not be at the expense of us residents. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hughes. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, ma'am. Please come forward. Good evening. My name is Catherine Rolson. I live at 11 Fenway Road. Uh, I don't have the longevity of some of my neighbors. I've only been there four years. But uh, I have not experienced any difficulties with parking even though most people do park in front of my house because I'm the first house after the cul-de-sac on the left side. People park there and I don't have a problem with that, but I do support the repeal of the ban of the one-sided parking. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Seeing no one else, I declare this public hearing is closed. Thank you very much for taking the time to come and give your thoughts to the council. Um, so we will move on to actual consideration of item number 230405 having to do with parking on Fenway Road. Do I hear a motion? Uh, Council Lynch. Lynch. Yes, I would move to repeal section 13-2-3 little q from the uh, Cape Elizabeth Code of Ordinances. Second. Okay. And for those watching, that means going back to parking on, having been That means allowing on parking on both sides of Fenway Road. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Some order of business. Do we need to take this off the table first? Uh, I think the taking off the table is for the next item, which is item number 13. Okay. No, that's okay. I was confused by that earlier today, too. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and, and uh, Councilor Backer said it last time, uh, probably more eloquently than I can, is that being on the Ordinance Committee, when we enacted this section, we were under the impression that the residents wanted this parking ban um, due to a um, Conservation Commission forum that was held. And that information came back to us that this was a way to control um, parking and access to Great Pond. Um, I'm going to support this. It's obvious that the, the residents don't support this. At least the vast majority of them do. And so um, I think we enacted this in good faith, um, in no way trying to um, negatively impact 
to the people on Fenway Road. Um, so, um, as I said, I'm going to support this. Any other discussion or comments? Councilor Roberts. Thank you. I had just a couple of comments in response. Um, Mr. Fulham had mentioned that uh, Fowler, uh, Fenway was 23 feet wide. I would note that Fowler Road, the feeder road, is only 22. Um, had not thought about that in particular, that um, we aren't limiting parking on all of the other streets that are that same width throughout town. And if we did, uh, basically we'd be limiting parking to one side on almost every street in the community. I don't think we want to go that route. Comment was made that I believe Mr. Hughes mentioned uh, perhaps putting uh, a road in through the other side from 77. It's, a, um, it's extreme wetland issues over there. It would cost the Sprague or somebody a fortune to put a road down across that to access the pond. I don't think that's particularly feasible. Where the problem results is that back in 83 or 84 when the uh, Great Pond condos went in, the, in the process of developing it, nothing was done at that time to preserve the access to the pond that was existing at that time, and that's unfortunate because people used to be able to take their trailers and everything else down into the, to the sand pit area and leave those there without having to access that through Fenway Road. And that was the standard way to get in. And as we all know, Great Ponds are supposed to have access. And it is unfortunate that that was overlooked and did not get done. Um, kind of like the situation with Broad Cove, where we always assume that we're going to have two ways out. It just didn't happen. The, there is a provision for parking at the end of uh, Fenway down in that same area that used to be the parking area. Um, but at the public hearings we've heard, I have not heard the, the residents express any great desire to do that. I don't think the police chief is really excited about having to police it down there with the parking out of sight either. So that's not the answer. Unfortunately, I don't believe they're, we're ever going to be able to resolve the problems that are down there. And uh, with, for, with the, a clear, clear majority of people wanting it back to two, uh, two ways, which is the way I did vote last time, I will vote to support that. That's clearly what, they, what the residents um, want. And, Unless I hear from the police chief or the fire chief that we have a safety issue, um, that would be the only thing that would perhaps convince me otherwise. Any further comments? Then let's move the question. All in favor of the motion? I'm sorry, uh, unanimous. I'm sorry, I couldn't see your hand, Marianne. Oh. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for everyone coming to uh, let us know what you think. And um, we'll be moving on to the next item. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, maybe we'll just, I know some people may want to leave, so we'll just take 10 seconds <coughs> to pause. Let people walk out. Okay, um, the next item is item number 13, which was 130405, which was tabled to this July meeting um, at last month's meeting. So it, it would be in order to have a motion to take this item off the table. Can I move? Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to take it off the table. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item number 13, consideration of Gullcrest Master Plan DEP permit easements, um, which we talked about at great length last month. Um, and I would ask the town manager for a brief recap of what's been happening on this. Thank you, Ann. Uh, as you mentioned uh, at the last meeting, there was, there was a long discussion. The DEP was requiring 75 acres to be uh, dedicated permanently. Uh, and there were some other concerns as well. Uh, it was an issue when, when I returned from being away for a week of uh, the need for an appeal by a certain date and uh, consulted with a number of attorneys and we, we ended up uh, working with Deirdre O'Callaghan of uh, Pretty Clarity. 
she, working uh, with the DEP, discovered an exemption in the law that provides uh, that if a boardwalk is used for public education purposes, uh, it, it avoids those mitigation requirements. Uh, she spoke with a couple of uh, DEP officials here in the local office as well as in Augusta. They both indicated they'd look very kindly upon a modification. Uh, Maureen was also on vacation. Uh, she returned from vacation and uh, prepared the materials modification. We're very appreciative of the letters we received from Village Crossing, uh, particularly from Ogden Williams, one of the teachers who, who indicates uh, you know, just how important it is and, and the other support as well. Uh, everything's gone well. This would, this would seem to be a, a really good answer. Uh, but, you know, I think George Tennant once told George Bush that finding WMDs in Iraq, that it was a slam dunk that was, that was going to happen. Um, uh, <laughs> I feel a little like George Tennant tonight. Uh, Maureen uh, spoke with the DEP today, and they're having second thoughts. Uh, they're, they're not so sure they'll approve this modification. So I think we, uh, we ought to proceed with the modification. It is an exemption in the law. We ought to have the DEP show the true character to see if they're going to uh, honor uh, their verbal commitment to us. And if not, we would be, again, in a, piece, in a position to, uh, to appeal. So I would uh, encourage you to authorize us to apply for the modification, and then uh, dependent upon what happens, uh, we'll get back to you and uh, let you know uh, how they've responded. But the indications are today that uh, they're having second thoughts. Councilor Ron. I would move that town manager be authorized to file a modification to the DEP permit to provide that the boardwalk be designated as being for public education purposes. Second, then moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Councilor Roberts. We have a precedence with this in the trail that we have at Great Pond. We at one point had uh, filed for and received grant monies through the Casco Bay Estuary Project. Maureen helped work on that one. We put in informational bollards and signs uh, describing the history, the wildlife, the fauna, and everything else down there. So I think we are in a good stead in proving that we have been good stewards of our wetlands. We have used them in the past as educa for educational purposes, and there's no reason we couldn't do something similar down at this location as well. And I think based on what the, the history of Great Pond, that would play in our favor uh, significantly. Thank you. I have a question, Lynch. I guess, for the manager or Maureen. Since the time for appeal has run, what happens if the bureaucrats do change their mind um, because my understanding is that this was worked out before the time for the appeal had run this understanding of the exemption so we obviously um, in reliance on this um, exemption and what we thought was a change in DEP's position did not file an appeal if I might, Madam Chairman. Yes. I, I think it would be foolhardy for us to give you any assurances based on previous DEP assurances. Okay, well, I just want to make sure that the record is clear in the minutes that this council had tabled it, wanting to get legal advice. Um, we did receive legal advice that uh, an appeal um, likely would be successful. We also received legal advice that there was an exemption and it was only because of that legal advice on the exemption that we did not, in, in, at least in my view, file an appeal in a timely fashion. So I just would like to make sure that the record is clear. And because, and also because the DEP officials assured us that they yes. were yes. considering this very seriously and we thought we had come to an agreement. Yes. So we did rely on it. If I could respond to the question, you can, you can be assured that we will uh, press that issue uh, before the DEP uh, when we uh, discuss this modification request with them. As well as I think the, the very excellent letters that, that Ogden and uh, mm -hmm. others have provided that, you know, un unfortunately, you know, they're giving these verbal indications today that say that, you know, that they won't consider it when they haven't even looked at the application, which, you know, 
I wonder about a regulatory agent, agency that is uh, spouting off positions on applications they haven't seen yet. It's, it strikes me as uh, odd. It says wait. Councilor Baxter, did you have a comment? I, I do. Um, first of all, I think this is a great result if it is successful. And by all means, I would encourage the town manager to proceed with the filing of the uh, amendment. But second, and more important, I want to thank Councillor Lynch for the effort that she made. And it was really because of her insistence at the last meeting um, that the um, requirement of the, D of the DEP was draconian and uncalled for, that we take another look at this, that we seek legal advice and back away from what had been presented to us for approval, that we sit where we are today with this amendment in front of us with a tentative verbal approval by the DEP. So I want to thank Mary Ann for um, her insistence that we take this path. Well, I, I thank you for those comments, but um, the council voted for it, and so it's the council, I think, that deserves the credit, and, the, and maybe particularly Councillor Roberts, who, um, being on the prevailing side, moved to reconsider when mm -hmm. I was unable to make that motion. So, I think we can say, and I was one of the ones who voted the other way so before. I I'm not congratulating <laughs> myself. Uh, I think we can say this was a good team effort, and I yes. think that Councillor Lynch, modest as she is, does deserve a great deal of credit for watching out for the right of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and not uh, moving us towards approving an easement over 75 acres of land, of town property that is really the property of the citizens um, for, uh, in exchange for a few thousand square feet of boardwalk. So we will think positively, assuming this motion passes and we authorize the town manager and I'm sure the manager will keep us informed as to development. Um, are there other comments? I think we're all set on comments. Shall we move the question? All those in favor of authorizing the town manager to file a modification to the DEP permit. It's unanimous. Thank you very much and uh, we wish you and uh, Maureen O'Meara well uh, in, in your efforts. And I do want to thank Ms. O'Meara, our town planner also, because she has worked long and hard on this, as well as the Conservation Commission and uh, many other people around town. Um, and hopefully this will have a good, good outcome for the citizens. Thank you very much. Back to our regular order of business, which is item number 24, having to do with cell tower overlay district. Do I hear a motion? I, Ms. I have a, I'd like to make a motion. Um, I would move that the council set August 9th for a public hearing on the proposed cellular tower overlay district in the Bowery Beach slash Fowler Road neighborhood area that's been identified. Second. And, oops, I'm sorry. Were you continuing? No. Go ahead, second, and then if I can. Second. So this is this is a change to what's on the sheet. Okay. Yes, and I just wanted to clarify. It was recommended that we um, set also for public hearing Shore Acres, and I um, would like to suggest that the council consider those separately. So um, my motion is um, just for August 9th for the um, Bowery Beach Fowler Road um, proposal, proposal, overlay. which is yes which is the only one that has a um, cell company that has made a proposal and has a willing landowner. Um, so that's one of the reasons I want to separate out the two. Okay. And I'll have another motion. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? And if, if I could... Just that she, you are going to make a, another motion for the uh, short. There will, yes, I think we will be dealing with Shore Acres, but it will just be separately. No, that's fine. Um, 
Are we going to have a report? I was just okay. going to ask. Um, I see Mr. Shaw is here. Oh, there you are. So I, I thought maybe we could have discussion after Mr. Shaw. That's what maybe, I would. Just, that be in order? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I can tell you used to be I'm in air after all. <laughs> I guess I'm sorry. <laughs> Anticipating my every move here. Um, Mr. Shaw is here, uh, and he has a brief report I would like him to make to us because uh, for citizens who may not be aware, the balloon went up some time ago showing the height of the cell tower and he has some photographs to show us and some information to convey to us. We are not making decisions on this motion tonight because it's only for setting a public hearing, but I thought it would be in the interest of public information to hear what he had to say. Mr. Shaw. Thank you, Thank you members of the board for an opportunity to speak here again tonight. Um, we do have a third location, and I would like to put up a map and just briefly explain where we've gone and where we're going, and then put the pictures up if that's okay. Yeah. <coughs> we'll put those pins in the shelf. Oh, thank you. Wouldn't want any bad accidents. <laughs> I'm trying to make this stay up. Blood dry on the plasma. <laughs> Is that high enough for you folks? Or put, up, up. Up. You know, pull the tab up on the metal thing and then put your pin on that tab. It'll go through. Yeah, like that. Thank you. <laughs> That's the back one. Technical issues here. <laughs> Pretty heavy. Sure. All right. Yeah, nobody sneezed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what, what I'd like to do is just briefly show where we were and then where we are. Um, the first time that we came before the council, um, this particular map shows Barry Breach Road or Route 77 here and then the intersection of Fowler Road that goes across it right here. So I've done a little bit of coloring and I put some dots on here, but this coloring green here is really the field area at the corner of Route 77 and Fowler Road. And this dot right here on the map was the first location that we proposed. It was approximately one football field away from the houses there. Um, we got the information, we, we uh, heard what you said. And the second time, uh, unfortunately, I thought I heard what you said and we moved it back further in the field behind the trees to give it some shade, or excuse me, to, for some coverage from Route 77, however, I, I totally missed it there. We were closer to the houses than we were before. I went back. I understood what you folks were saying, I believe. We met with the Sprague's and they had another board meeting. And one of the locations that we've come up with now is across the field, over the ridge, and where this dot is located here. This dot is approximately 1,600 feet, well, it is 1,600 feet from Fowler Road, which is five football fields instead of one. It's approximately a third of a mile. And because of the elevation in this particular location, it's a little bit higher from Route 77. So we need to go in about 400 feet from Route 77 to get to that location. So this particular location is 400 feet off Route 77. It's approximately um, parallel or directly in from where the line is on Route 77 for the Beach to Beacon Race if you wanted to um, be able to physically see where it was. We have put some ribbons at a gate there and some ribbons where the actual tower location would be if someone would like to review it. And don't forget to tell about the ticks. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Nine the last time I was in there. There are a lot of ticks in there. I was in there for the balloon test that I did do. Um, my wife was very gracious when I got home. I found three on the way home, she found six more, so you do want to be uh, careful if you do go into that location, make sure you spray yourself real well. <laughs> After I met with the town council and we talked at the workshop, one of the other things that was brought up was uh, could we do a balloon test to find out what the tower would look like um, at that location. I went out uh, four different times and tried to raise the balloon and unfortunately it was a little too breezy and it was blowing it so that I could not get an accurate depiction of 180 feet. However, on the fifth time I did uh, have uh, circumstances where the wind wasn't there. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. It was really odd that day. But I was able to have it up there for approximately an hour 
And after I raised it to 180 feet, I went out to five particular locations that I think I was asked by the town council to look at. Um, one of those locations was the um, intersection of 77 and Spurwink Road, where the church is located. And from that location, the tower is not visible and could not be seen there. As a matter of fact, from the church all the way down to the intersection of Fowler Road, it was not visible. But when you did come across, coming from the Scarborough uh, direction on Route 77, when you get right at the corner there, there was a place where you could see the tower, and I took a picture from that, and in a moment I'll show you those pictures. But I took a picture from Route 77, I went further down past, right at the line there, because of the height of the trees, you have to look through the branches to be able to see it. It's not visible across the top of the trees right at the line. But a little further down at this location, you could see it, and I took a picture, and that's probably the closest place on, that you can see the tower from anywhere. And it's about, um, I'd say, anywhere from 50 to 100 feet, and maybe 50 to 100 yards along 77. You can see it, and then it disappears again. I went on down to the entrance to um, Crescent Beach. It is no longer visible all the way along here and not at Crescent Beach as well. Um, so I went back up on the Fowler Road and as I drove through here because of the leaves this time of year, you had to look through to be able to see it, but I did find one place where there was an old logging road of some sort or farming road where you could look through and see the balloon. I took a picture from there and I'll show you that as well. And then I went further down Fowler Road. Um, and I don't know that I have the dock in the right place, I'll have to check, but I, 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 I pulled over in front of a gentleman's home and I went across the street to see if I could see it. And it happened to be Jack's house. I did not know that he lived there. But he came out and we took a look at it. And you really have to go across the street and then look down at this direction to be able to see it here. All of the views along Fowler Road out toward the water are completely not affected by it. But if you look down at that angle, you can see the top of it. I took a picture and have done a photo simulation from there as well. And then I also drove up to Fenway um, Road, I guess Fenway Road. I drove down through there. Um, I had not heard from Maureen and Mara about getting permission to be on someone's property to take the pictures, but there was a few locations that I could, between the houses, see where the balloon was, so I took one from there, and I have that picture as well. So those are the five pictures that I took and that I have here for photo simulations of the house. Time to take it down. <laughs> I think that was your cue for the next yes, uh, set of yep. pictures. It might be easier to just set it on the... <laughs> man. This is a manager who has many duties. Yes, he does. Just don't rest too hard on <laughs> From the intersection of Fowler Road is behind me, and this is Route 77 heading in um, toward Crescent Beach. You can see the 45 mile an hour um, sign here. I'm looking across the field. If you get up closer, you could see the little balloon in this particular picture. It's actually a three-foot balloon um, in diameter. And what I've done here is show the balloon, and then in this picture, taken from the balloon down and placed uh, a, a tower to show a photo simulation of that. So again, it'll be a little easier when you're up close to look at these, but each one of these would be, there's a balloon here, and then in this particular um, picture, I've taken the balloon down for a photo simulation of the tower. The tower at 100 feet is approximately four feet across. At the top, it's two and a half feet. I used a three foot balloon, so I used three feet all the way down to the tree line, a little give and take to bear on that. This particular picture um, was taken on Fenway Road, and again, I was on the, looking by between the trees and the house, you could see the balloon in on this picture just a small dot really, uh, but what I did was I took the uh, same thing and did a simulation of what the tower would look like 
from the houses on Fenway looking across, that's what they will see there. So this picture represents what it looks like from Fenway. This one here is on Fowler Road um, by Jack. Like I said before there, uh, the pond is out straight across here, but if you look down at an angle, you can see the balloon there. And I've taken this picture and shown where you'll be able to see the tower from Fowler Road there. And then this picture up here is the one location directly across from this one where I looked through the trees and could see it. And just one more um, and it shows the balloon in this particular picture, and then I put a simulation of what the tower would look like here with it. And the last one was that one that I said is the closest to the tower, which is located right across 77, just down from the line. And you can see on this particular picture the three-foot balloon right at the top, and did the photo simulation underneath it there. So I have those pictures for people to get a visual of what it would look like for that tower to be in that location. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. Is I, I don't want this to turn into a, a huge presentation, but um, if there are any questions for clarification that the counselors have for Mr. Shaw before he sits down. <laughs> I think Jack has a stand up. Um, pardon me. I, I, have I just question. have a, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll do more. I asked Jack first. Uh, we'll get to the next. Not one. a question particularly. I actually went down a couple of times trying to see that. That's how I knew Ed had the ticks all over him. I only stepped into the off the side of the road and had two of them on me. But I just want to make it clear that from my house, I will not be able to see this tower. I would have to walk across the street to see it. So as far as the discussions are concerned, I can still see the one out back, but I would not see that one. So I just want it clear that I don't have any particular bias one way or the other as far as my own personal residence is concerned. Um. <laughs> I, I have a, a council question because my, the motion was just for a public hearing in August, and I assume that most of the substantive discussion would probably take place in August after we hear from the public. But the question I have is, can we have these at town hall so that the public can see them, and or can we put them on the town website so that the public can see them? Mr. Shaw, I mean, as far as can we have the pictures? My intention was to leave it here, um, like I did from the workshop, pictures of the actual site, what it looks like. I'll leave them here. I also have all of those pictures um, on my computer and would be happy to send them to Maureen or whoever in the town to be able to put them on the website if that would be your preference. We could make that happen, Mr. Manager. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions for Mr. Shaw, just to clarify? Uh, I'm sorry, not counselor, <laughs> Mr. Manager. Thank you, Ann. Whoever you are. Yeah, there was an article in one of the newspapers uh, recently that said that this could that we weren't weren't interested in using this for public safety purposes. I just wanted to indicate that 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 is not the case. Uh, that we still do want to use it for public safety purposes. Uh, we have other options, but we think this is the best option. And wondered if. Uh, Part of the arrangement with, uh, with the particular firm is still to allow uh, the, the town to put repeaters and other devices that we need on the tower. Mr. Shaw. Yeah, from the beginning, uh, we have said that the uh, public safety would be reserved to be able to be on that tower. We continue to uh, feel that way, and that would be the, would be the plan. Thank you for clarifying the record on that. After the experience with the DEP, I thought it would be good to get a public assurance. <laughs> Any further questions? I'm sorry, Councilor Mullins. I just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Shaw and thank you to Seth Sprague and the Sprague family for working so hard to find a location for the cell tower that was both aesthetically pleasing to the neighborhood as well as uh, physically functional to give us better cell coverage in that area of the Cape Lewis. I, I would just mention the ground elevation is the same in all three of those locations, and if anything, it provides better coverage in Cape Elizabeth, a little less in Scarborough by being closer. I wanted to state Great. that as well. I want to thank you, Mr. Shaw, for bringing this, uh, these pictures and the map to us. I think it has clarified some of the facts um, of the issue, and it has made us able to provide this information to the public. Um, and I think our intent would be to have these pictures and, and the map, perhaps, um, at Town Hall in the Council Chambers, Mike, for um, just
just just as we did when we were looking at the lot next door for buildings there, for people to come by and look at them if they want, and if we can get them on the uh, website, that would be good too. Councilor Roberts. Well, we're getting things on the record, and you had indicated the other day when I was talking with you that you intended to put a monopole up. Um, would there be any type of pictures that could be available here showing what that looks like? I, mean, I know what that one looks like, but I'm not sure everybody else does. That we could have at town hall as to how a, a monopole looks. A monopole? You mean just for the viewers? You mean as opposed to one of those three-legged or no, four-legged no, oil derrick? It's oil uh, derrick kind of power. Yes, they would be available. We recently have had two of them put up, but they're identical to this one. I will take pictures and make them available. Uh, that would be helpful as well. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. This has been most informative. Um, we have a motion before us. If there is no further discussion, I'd like to move the question on the um, motion to set the... Further I'm discussion? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did, didn't have a, another question for um, Mr. Shaw specifically. But I, I do want to raise the question, and this is something that I had raised with Maureen earlier today. I had called her and asked her about this. And that is... Um, if we are going to set this for public hearing, which I am in favor of doing, um, is it appropriate for us to comment on the dimensions of the specific proposed overlay district that is going to be set for hearing? Is that something that should be addressed tonight, or is that something better addressed at another date? Because I do have comments I'd like to make. I think it would be appropriate to deal with it tonight because if we are going to set it for public hearing, we want to make sure we know exactly the boundaries. I, I was going by the boundaries on this uh, paper that was given to us, item right. number 224. But if you have um, some different thoughts, have at it. Mr. Shaw confirmed that the tower site itself was... 400 feet roughly northeast of the edge of Bowery Beach Road. The ordinance that we have currently requires a um, perimeter, what we call, we, we, we've referred to as a uh, fall zone or a uh, setback of 125% of the height of the tower. And in this case, if we're looking at a 180-foot tower, the setback would therefore be 225 feet from the base of the tower. And if the tower is being located 400 feet from the edge of Bowery Beach Road, the setback therefore brings it to um, 175 feet northeast of the edge of Bowery Beach Road if I'm, my math is right. Mm -hmm. So my proposal would be that the outline of the proposed tower overlay district itself not start at the edge of Bowery Beach Road, but instead be set in 175 feet from Bowery Beach Road just to ensure that the tower as located will in fact be 400 feet in from Bowery Beach Road, and that we won't be surprised by finding it move 175 feet closer to Bowery Beach Road than we've anticipated. And with the tower overlay district as drawn, although the representation is that the intent is for it to be 400 feet from Bowery Beach Road, if we approve this district, the tower certainly could be located 175 feet closer to Bowery Beach Road. Technically, that is correct. So uh, what I'd like to propose is that in order to ensure that there are no surprises with the location, that we have the district be drawn so that there is a 175-foot buffer between the edge of Bowery Beach Road and the edge of the proposed tower overlay district. Um, I, I know Mr. Shaw was trying to answer one of your questions, so I'll let him just answer that question and then I know there's further discussion. Mr. Shaw? Yeah, uh, if you go to the tower location and then you were to walk toward uh, Route 77, the elevation does go down. And elevation uh, in this particular area is extremely important. The reason why we chose to go up all the way to Bowery Beach 
was the two other overlay zones that are in Cape Elizabeth where the entire piece of the property there. And when I met with Maureen and we were trying to locate where this was spoke in layman's terms, if you will, so that people could go there and understand where it was going to be, saying that it was 150 feet off and then turning an angle and doing this and doing that seemed more confusing. And in discussions with the Sprague's, that 175 feet, if you will, along um, Route 77, whether it's an overlay district or not, it's not going to be able to be used, so why don't we just make it a square that's parallel to the right of way on Route 77. So I would have to go back to the Sprague's and discuss that with them and see if that's uh, acceptable to them, but it was never our intent to make it larger so that we could move the tower somewhere else. We wanted to get to the highest spot on that topography map. We have it identified and we would send those coordinates to the FAA and that's our intent. But again, I, I, I'll wait for your feedback on what we need to do from here. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Councilor Lynch. The question I have, and I, I David, I'm, I um, appreciate your pointing this out. I'm wondering if we notice this area for a public hearing and it's a larger area. It strikes me that we can always, um, and I don't know which way counselors are going to go, but um, we could um, look at an amendment on the 9th after we hear public comment on shrinking the district. And that gives them time to work out whatever they might have to work out as well. But yep. thank you. We could prepare a map for the ninth that, that shrinks it accordingly. Okay. I didn't, and I'm a, just if I might add a little more, I'm a little bit nervous with Councillor Backer's to the foot. Yeah. You know, when you do geotechnical work for to put something this big in the ground, it could be some shifting of five, ten feet. And, uh, you know, I'd suggest that if you gave a, if that's your intent, you gave about 25 feet more leeway uh, in the real world it might work better in exact placement. And I'm not beholden to the foot, to the inch, but it's the concept. The concept is to carve off a strip that's along the frontage of the road so that that would not be part of the overlay district. This is the map that I used with Maureen, and we put that map together. This is the one that was actually surveyed in the park. <laughs> so it shows the location of it, and we just went at right angles from Barry Breach to be able to be simple that way to be able so folks would know where it was. So we could use, to, to pick up on the, the manager's comment, we could use a copy of that as sort of version A, the slightly bigger version, and then carve off, I, I personally happen to agree with the manager that maybe we'd rather carve off 150 feet as a version just to allow a little play there and have that be version B and sort of have both be noticed. Well, that's my uh, I'm very sympathetic to what David has brought up and, and very open to shrinking a district as, to make it as small as possible. I just want to make sure that um, it's all very well thought out and, and that's why I'm suggesting if we leave it for tonight noticing the larger mm -hmm. area, everyone can go back and sharpen their pencils, so to speak, and see what they can do to shrink it as much as possible, um, but not, it's, it's hard for me to feel that we have the expertise to just do it here tonight, and if we shrink it too much, then maybe we have some notice issues on the ninth. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I don't care when it's done, and that's why I preface my comments by asking whether tonight was the appropriate time to raise it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's fine, I, I don't have any objection with um, Sending it, sending it to public hearing as presented to us okay. with the understanding that it's an issue that I would at least like discussed whenever the time is appropriate. Great. The, the staff will be ready with a draft proposal that, that you can look at before the meeting that will, that will seek to meet your objectives. Thank you. And there is, no, if I could ask for a point of clarification, there is no problem, as Councillor Lynch has suggested, there is no problem with noticing it with a slightly, the current size that it is 
And if we wanted to then shrink it, there's no problem with there, that. There would, there would be a problem if it went the other way. There's never a problem. There's with never a problem with shrinking. Okay, practically speaking. Okay. <laughs> Further discussion? Council. Madam Chair, um, oh, I'm always open to hearing people's comments at public hearings. Um, but I'm going to vote against um, having a public hearing on this issue because I think there are a lot of problems with it. Um, I, I think we could, as the ordinance is written, we could have several towers in that location be, um, because, as I understand it, the overlay district allows more than one. Um, I haven't heard a huge outcry of people wanting cell phone power um, service in this area where we've heard a lot of people opposed to having a tower. Um, we've asked the town planner to, um, through the manager, to uh, provide us with some information, some ordinances that um, provide different alternatives and particularly stealth technology. I personally um, lean favorably toward one of the ones that was presented, which was from California, that had some good techniques for stealth technology and not the Evans Tower. Um, and also, I, I ran into um, a friend who lived half the time in Italy and half the time here. And we were talking about cell towers and cell phones in, in Europe and as opposed to the United States. And they use satellite technology. Um, they don't have any power. Uh, and they have, I mean, people in Europe are talking on cell phones a lot more than they have here. So um, I don't think this is the right proposal to take a look at this. So we go from there. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion um, before we move to question on setting the public hearing? Okay, all those in favor of setting the public hearing for Monday, August 9th, 2004 for the Fowler Road Bower slash Bowery Beach Road proposed tower overlay district. All in favor? Six, opposed, one. Any comments? When we put it out, it should probably list it as the Bowery Beach overlay because it's really not on Fowler Road any longer. Yeah. Is that, <laughs> that's true. Is that what we want to call it? But you're right. It's a, a third of a mile away from Fowler hmm. Road, and, or or the this this, time, like, this action started on December 8th, and to to have everyone understand that it is still that same action. It would be best to continue to refer to it the same way so that everyone is aware that, that we're talking about the same series of review, the same series of proposals. I, right. Then I, I think it's appropriate. Just for the sake of clarity, people are used to thinking of it that way. So. Great. Council Lynch. Now, I have a second motion to um, finish up the business under item 240405, and I would move to accept the recommendation of the planning board do not establish a tower overlay district in Shore Acres. Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the, um, I'm sorry, to accept the planning board's uh, recommendation on Shore Acres propo proposed tower overlay district. Is there discussion? Uh, no. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I see, so I can explain my motion and then I see Councilor McGinty looking very quizzical. Okay. Um, you recall that we had several months ago sent to the planning board to ask them to look at whether or not there should be a tower overlay district at Shore Acres. They then sent back, they did so, they did what we requested, then they sent back to us a recommendation that there not be a tower overlay district in Shore Acres. It's also, so we have their recommendation, it is also my understanding that we have no cell, cellular company seeking to locate a tower there, nor do we have a willing landowner seeking to build a tower. So it strikes me um, as somewhat ridiculous almost to have a public hearing on the creation of a sour, tower cellular district where the planning board has recommended against it 
Um, and I understood that was in part because the only potential area at this point would be the Portland Water District land, which is not, the lot itself is not large enough to take care of the setbacks. So it seems to me silly to set for public hearing a tower overlay district in an area that can't support it. And there is no proposal before us, so. That's at least that's an explanation. And, the, and there is a recommendation. And there is a recommendation the from the planning board to not establish a cell, cellular tower district. Okay. Council McGinty. I, I guess my physical look was just to ensure that what we're hmm. doing with with saying we're not we don't approve of a cellular, cellular overlay district at that location. That if that accomplishes. That was. Yes, that's what that was the planning board's because recommendation. Because the planning board's recommendation is to, they recommended that we not have a cellular overlay district at that Shore at Acre that site. Shore Acre site. So I don't, again, I, unless someone here wants to move forward, I don't see any reason to even have a public hearing on that. It's been moved. Was it seconded? I couldn't. It must. It was. We're in discussion. I'm sorry. We're in discussion. Councilor Roberts. Just a, a point of clarification. I think I spoke with the town manager earlier, and Michael can speak for himself, obviously. But it's my understanding that even though there is no tower overlay district at Shore Acres, theoretically, if somebody wished to put a tower or a repeater or other equipment on the water tower, that would not be precluded, even though it is not a tower overlay district. Uh, I think that needs to be understood by everybody. I don't get that. Was it Maureen? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maureen, could you come forward? So, uh, if I understand Councilor Roberts' point, he is saying that even though, even if there were no district up at Shore, power overlay district up at Shore Acre, someone could still put a an antenna or something on the water if, district tower? If they could camouflage it so it looked like a part of the tower. All you need is a building permit. Anywhere in town, anytime you want to install telecommunications technology, and you can camouflage it so it doesn't look like telecommunications technology, all you need is a building permit. So it goes for the water tower as well. If you can install antenna in the railings or you know do something creative and where there's a will, there's a way. Um, all you would need is a building permit. You'd need to demonstrate to the code enforcement officer that it indeed looked like part of the water tower. I didn't know with, that. With that, I hate to say it, but I agree with Councilor Lynch. <laughs> Why do you hate to say that? <laughs> <laughs> we all have to be at odds. <laughs> okay. We don't always have to be at odds. <laughs> Any further questions or discussion? Hearing none. Um, let's move the question on accepting the planning board's recommendation that there be no tower overlay district at the Shore Acres site. All in favor that there be no district. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I encourage, uh, I th I, once again, I want to thank Mr. Shaw. Um, for taking the photos, I think they're very helpful. The photos and the map showing the points from which the photos were taken will be at town hall in this chamber for, for the public to review. Um, and we will also try to see if we can get the same information up on the website um, so that the public can review it on the website too. We will be looking forward to um, hearing from the public either at the public hearing August 9th or beforehand, anybody who wants to write or call or email or whatever, let us know what you think about this particular site and or about cell phone coverage in town in general. Um, so thank you very much and we will move on. And our next item is item number 25 having to do with paper streets at Shore Acres. Um, basically what this is about is receiving the report of the planning board and setting a public hearing for August 9th. Um, however, discussion can go anywhere it can go. So do I hear a motion? Councilor Moles. 
Yes, Madam Chair, I would make a motion that we receive the report of the Planning Board regarding uh, the town um, taking over the paper, giving out the paper street, the Shore Acres, and that we set that for a public hearing on Monday, August 9th, 2004. Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? And Ms. O'Meara is here if there are any questions. No discussion? All in favor of setting it for public hearing and receiving the report? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. The next item is item number 26, 0405, uh, sewer fund deficit avoidance. And I would encourage the manager to give us a brief overview. His memo was pretty comprehensive, but he may want to make a brief statement. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ann. All of the, the memos that, that the council has got on this subject, including the spreadsheets, are available on the website as a link of the article on the uh, front page of it that uh, ties into the sewer fund. Uh, what I'm recommending is a public hearing next month on a sewer rate increase. Uh, the reason being is that expenditures have exceeded revenues in six out of the last seven years. The fund balance has dropped from 557000 down to under 20000 In other words, over the last seven years, we've lost 520000 in the sewer fund. Uh, without a rate increase, we'd have 111000 deficit a year from now. Uh, without a rate increase, the deficit would continue to rise so that it would be 480000 by fiscal year 2009. We're actually receiving less from sewer, from the sewer fees this year than we did 10 years ago. Uh, the annual income has been in a very narrow range uh, between 1.25 million roughly and 1.3 million over the last five, five to 10 years. Uh, we're reducing maintenance and investment in the system all the time. Uh, and uh, the specific increase is to take the the min current minimum of, of $26.50 raises $5.31.50 to change the incremental rate that for each additional 100 cubic feet over the minimum to increase that by 3% from $4 per 100 cubic feet to uh, $4.12 and also a uh, $300 increase to the various connection fees. Um, you know, I, I never like to recommend rate increases, but I think the situation is critical. Without, without an increase, and as you can see from the pro forma here, uh, you know, even with this increase, we're still looking at a very narrow range of uh, fund balances. Uh, the fund balance would not go to 32000 until fiscal year 2007. And as it is, we, we have 280000 roughly in receivables in the sewer fund. So, you know, the fund balance isn't even covering the receivables. So we're indirectly subsidizing the general fund by the sewer fund by the general fund and providing tax flow to the sewer fund. So I would encourage the council to uh, set a public hearing. And, and one of the council's draft goals is to look at all the special funds this year. So I would hope, and it, this action I think really needs to be moved on quick, but I would hope that in the longer run the council would continue to look at some of the, not only the sewer fund issues and sewer policy issues, but also some of the issues and policies related to the other fund. Thank you very much, Mr. McGovern. Do I hear a motion? I'll move um, that we set a public hearing for adjustments in the sewer rates for Monday, August 9th, 2004. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Councilor. Councilor Robert. Chairman Swiftana. I would like to see this rate information put on the, on the web page, if possible, too, so people can see the discrepancy of what people in Cape Elizabeth are paying compared to other communities. And it may encourage some folks to think to start thinking strongly about perhaps adding some connections in areas that aren't through ledge to to put that uh, as the council thinks about it. Uh, it has some input from the citizens as well, because the only way you're going to really get that rate into line is by having more people on the system. Otherwise, we're going to be paying six and seven times more than anybody else is on a regular basis. 
and for the folks that are on a septic system, it's not fair to them to have to maintain a septic tank and be subsidizing the folks on the sewer. I think that's an excellent suggestion to have that information on the website and the manager has just told me that that is part of the package of information that is on the website. So that will be available to the public. Thank you. Any hmm. further comments? Councilor Well, I'm, I'm just um, wanting to clarify. I mean, part of the reason, if I remember correctly, um, that we in Cape Elizabeth pay more in sewer fees is, and, and we pay Cumberland pays a comparably similar larger amount than, say, Portland is because our houses on sewer are part of the park from each other. Um, so that, you know, you're connecting houses that are distant apart and it's a more expensive system. And we have a lot of pumping stations up and down. And so um, it's not that easy to compare towns. Further discussion? Oh, this is Council Lynch. I just um, I just want to echo um, Councillor Roberts. We have a lot of unused capacity in that system, and um, I I hope that as we go forward as a council looking at special fees and this fee, that one of the things we look at is how to um, maximize the use of that unused capacity because that will benefit not only all of the um, people who are on sewer, but it will also benefit the environment to have more people on sewer and less people on septic, so. Thank you. Any further comments? Let's move to questions. All in favor of the motion to set this issue for public hearing for August 9th? Are you voting or not? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't wait to hear the motion. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. Item number 270405 <clears throat> has to do with um, appointments to boards and commissions. Uh, the policy for appointments to boards and commissions. Do I hear a motion? I'm sorry, Councilor Beck. I'm getting whiplash just my head going back and forth here. Um, I move that the council consider a repeal of paragraph eight of the standing policy relating to appointments of standing boards and commissions that currently reads, members of the planning board may not concurrently serve as members of the governing board of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. So is your motion to do so or is your motion to discuss it? Uh, my motion is to, dis is to, well, it was to discuss it, but maybe it should be to repeal it and then just vote that up or down. So let me make the motion that way, and then I'd like to speak to it. Okay. So I'm sorry, let me rephrase my motion. Okay. Um, I move that the council repeal paragraph eight of the standing policy relating to appointments of standing boards of commissions, which currently reads, members of the planning board may not concurrently serve as members of the governing board of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Council Frick, we seconded. Okay, discussion. I will go back to Councilor Backer because he wanted to discuss. I mean, this was, um, I'll open the discussion because this was put on the agenda um, at my request, um, in large part because I felt that the um, citizen who was seeking an explanation deserved to have it discussed at a public forum to flesh out uh, the reasons for the standing policy. and. When this was raised some time ago, it may have even been in a workshop that we first heard it as opposed to a council meeting and there was a brief explanation given to us as to the reason for the existence of the policy. Um, but the packet that we've been given um, for tonight's meeting has a very good history of the issue that goes far beyond anything that was presented to us in the past. 
Um, however, having received the packet, I spoke with our town planner, and I have learned that in the past 10 years, <coughs> um, apparently there have been no donations to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust by developers as part of the planning board development process. The zoning ordinance that we have currently requires that um, open space in conjunction with any development be either given to, uh, dedicated to the town as open space, or that it be under common ownership um, by the owners of units, perhaps as a common area in a condominium development, for example, um, or among other things given to the land trust. And it's up to the planning board, apparently, to decide which of those is most appropriate. Am I saying that right, or is it up to the developer to make that choice? Um, Mike? Yeah. Um, I, the planning board has the option, I think, to impose an impact fee. Uh, and that impact fee can either be monetary or it can be by a land donation. Um, I'm just unclear as to once the planning board selects land donation as the option as opposed to a monetary payment, whether it is up to the planning board or whether it's up to the developer to choose whether the land donation goes to the town or to the land trust or is dedicated in some other way. The, the process would be the developer proposes, the planning board says yay or nay. Uh, if, if the developer proposed that it go to the land trust or some other body, uh, the, the planning board would have the option of saying yay or nay. Uh, if, if ultimately it's to go to the town, uh, and not to the land trust, there is one extra step in the process in addition to the planning board needing to approve it, the council would also need to approve it. The council would not need to approve a uh, donation to the land trust or to any other entity other than to the town. Therein lies the potential conflict of interest um, where a developer faced with the obligation to make an impact fee contribution of land as to whether that donation is going to go to the town or to the land trust. And even though there have been no donations to the land trust in the last 10 years, certainly the potential is there. Um, as remote as that potential seems to be, um, I do recognize the potential there for a conflict of interest. And um, it seems to me that we have enough opportunities available for citizens to volunteer and commit their time to various boards, committees, elected positions on the town council or the school board, that to the extent that there is this one conflict that exists, that it's not inappropriate for the policy as written um, to prohibit a citizen from serving on both the land trust and the planning board. So um, I wanted the information out. I'm sorry that the citizen who raised this isn't here tonight. Um, but even though I asked that it be set for hearing, and even though I've made the motion, um, I am not in favor of changing the policy in light of the information that's been presented to us in our packet in my conversation with the town planner and my understanding of the ordinances. Thank you very much. Is there further discussion or comment? Council Fitz. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think a lot of this policy came up as far as the confusion um, because when the land trust was very new. Um, the, the land trust was formed in the, around 1986. And this was first brought up in 1988 when it was only two years old. And I don't think anybody really, I mean, land trusts were quite new entities at that time. And, um, and then again, it was, it was still new in 91, really. But now we have what, about 18 years of experience. And as you said, there have been no 
donation to the land trust where they, I think, where it would have been a conflict of interest. So I'm real. I really have a lot of um, difficulty with this issue because it doesn't seem that the town and the land trusts are in conflict because both policies are the same. And the land trust is trying to protect land for trails for public use. The ordinances and town policies promote the same thing in the ordinances. So it doesn't seem that there's a conflict there. And and our legal our, a lawyer has said that, that there isn't a pecuniary interest and there is there isn't a bias. Um, in, in these kinds of situations. But then when I come to the appearance of a conflict, um, that's where it seems to be a bit sticky. And I, I guess my, I mean, is, I ended up resigning from the land trust board myself when I came on the council because I didn't want there ever to be question about losing open space because of it. So I would hate to see a vote on the planning board be lost in favor of open space um, because of somebody brought the, the conflict of interest issue because there was somebody that was on both boards. So I guess I have to vote against this motion um, and keep the policy as it is. But I think it's, it's a very difficult one. It seems to me it's not fair to pick on one particular um, group of people who have the same goal and say they can't serve. Um, but we have had people who have come forward um, I, in my role as an appointment committee, who were willing to step down and, and still wanted to be on, on the planning board. Um, they can go back on again um, to the board when they should. Um, so it's, di it's difficult. And, and I do apologize to Janet McKay, who wrote a letter to me individually, and I was on vacation at the time, and then her letter got lost in my huge stack of mail when I got home, so I do apologize publicly to her for my lack of response. Thank you very much. Is there further discussion? Councilman McGinty. Um, I can't add much more than, than Dave or Carol. Um, that's, I can't come down the same side. I don't think there's any fiduciary uh, conflict of interest, um, but I think that there's, there's the potential for the appearance of a conflict when the town planning board, uh, the land trust, are all looking at a particular piece of property and how it may may be protected. I, just, I can just see a potential for that um, appearance of a conflict, and so uh, I won't be supporting a motion on it. Councilor Roberts. Thank you. I'm not persuaded to change it either, and David summed it up very well. I guess I might feel differently if a person serving on the land, land trust board, if it was a paid position and we were saying to somebody, you've got to give up a salary in order to serve on, on the planning board or other com committees, another type of, um, not just that one, but other people, other boards and commissions. But it's not a situation where they're on another volunteer board. I, well, the problems that we've had in the past with the appearance of uh, who are they giving the land trust money, or who are they giving the land to? There were questions about uh, the town and the land trust competing for the same pieces of land. There, were, there was all kinds of things that came up a number of years ago. And it's working well the way it is now. I, I think we really ought to leave it the way it is. Councilor Moll. For the uh, public that might watch us on TV or read the minutes later, uh, this year I'm the chairman of the appointments committee, but for the last year I've sat with Councillor Fritz and Councillor Roberts on the appointments committee. And first of all, I want to say that Cape Elizabeth has 
absolutely wonderful volunteers that give their time and effort on all our committees, the planning board, the zoning board, the library, uh, et cetera, not meaning to leave anyone out. And when there's a vacancy, we seriously consider and debate back and forth who is the best of these candidates that come up for these positions. Because truly, when we get three or four candidates for a position, they're all of such high stature and such good recommendations that we could pick any one of them and they do fine. Uh, however, I, I also feel that there's a little bit too uh, much of the ability to perceive a conflict of interest if someone is on both the Board of Governors of the Cape Land Trust and the Planning Board. And while we're interviewing candidates, if a candidate is not willing to step down off the Board of Governors for the Cape Land Trust, and other candidates are, then they wouldn't have made it through the process anyways because it would have been evident that there seems to be more of a perceived conflict of interest. But I want the public to know that we very carefully consider who we put on these boards throughout the town. Uh, and just because someone were to step down off the, the board doesn't change their viewpoint on whether we should have more or less open space. You know, their, their, their thoughts don't suddenly change. And as an appointments board, we're aware of that, but we are aware of what a perceived conflict is, and when someone's willing to step out of that, that they do make a better appointment for that board. So, okay. Thank you. Any further comments? Hearing none, let's move to questions. The um, motion was to repeal the paragraph 8, in other words, to change the current policy. So a yes vote is to change the policy, the current policy. So all in favor of repealing? Zero. All those opposed? It's unanimous in opposition. Thank you very much. And I want to echo um, Councillor Mulder's comments that we have excellent excellent citizens, um, qual very qualified candidates for all our boards and commissions, and we appreciate their service to the town very, very much. But I do also want to uh, extend my appreciation to Councillor Backer for bringing this to t uh, the attention so that it could be discussed in public so that the public could understand, as well as this particular citizen, could understand um, why the council has made the decision it has. Moving on. Um, Let's see, item number 280405, approval of balances to be carried forward in fiscal year 2005. And the manager um, before this meeting put forth a, a slightly amended worksheet showing these carry forward balances. Is there anything that Mr. McGovern would like to say about these? Just so that everyone's clear, the, the sheet that was on your, your, your desk here it would be all the same numbers you had in the first column except for just the two changes that are in the revised column, both library donation funds. Also pleased to report that uh, the one here that's the Chase Fund, they had applied for a matching grant from Georgia Pacific and a check since July 1 has arrived for another $10,000. Very you. generous. Thank you very much. Council McGinty. Um, they, the bottom line numbers did, did not change. No, those would, those would be adjusted by those. those so those should be adjusted. Any further questions for the manager? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm always looking the wrong way. Councilor Mole. Yes, uh, if I might address the town manager uh, briefly. Uh, Mr. Manager, uh, we had discussed the other day, actually uh, from a discussion we had had during a council meeting in May about looking to fund some of Family Fund Day out of any carry forward or surplus balances. Is this the appropriate point to bring up that discussion? To the chairman, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, with the uh, permission of the chairman, I'd like to make a motion which would be slightly amended from the motion we have before us and, and discuss that if, if we may. Okay, we have no, no one has made a motion, motion yet, but so. So we have okay, no motion. I'd like to make that motion. Go ahead, make a motion. Okay. Um, item 
280405. I would like to make a motion that we approve the um, balances to be carried forward as presented on the amended form by uh, Manager McGovern uh, with one slight change that we, as we had discussed in May, find uh, some additional funds out of this for the Family Fund Day, and my suggestion would be for $10,000, which I will discuss after I make the motion. So my, my motion to amend this is to approve this as written by Councilor McGovern um, with the slight change of $10,000 to be set aside from Family Fund Day uh, out of whichever account you want, although I would assume that the uh, use of surplus from the succeeding year would be the, the correct account, but Manager McGovern may have uh, a more correct account on that. Okay, that's the motion. Do I hear a second? A second. Okay. Now, if I, now I might discuss discussion. why I've, I've amended the initial uh, request that way. Uh, this year, uh, we used funds that were carried over from last year for Family Fund Day. And we were very frugal with the funds. Uh, we spent less than $2,000 on Family Fund Day this year, uh, which for all that went on, that is tremendous. This used to be a budget item in the, the 12000 or more range. However, Family Fun Day, as great as it was, was truly lacking for the lack of fireworks. Uh, it, without the firework display in the evening, it is not an event that people really put on their calendars and want to stay in town for. Uh, and this is really our Cape Elizabeth Day. This is the day when residents of Cape Elizabeth and their families get together to spend some time together. Uh, and we'd like to bring some specialness back to that day. The fireworks cost almost $8,000 between the fireworks and the permits to put them on. That cost has been increasing over the years, which is why I'm asking for $10,000 to be set aside out of these surplus funds for Family Fun Day. Uh, and any additional funds that they would need after that, they would have to raise, uh, the Family Fun Day Committee would have to raise through donations. So again, they would continue to run as frugally as possible but knowing that we have some money set aside for the fireworks would give us the ability to attract more groups that may help perform at the event and make a, a better event of this for the town. So in my lack of eloquence, I think you understand where I'm, I'm going with this, and I would really like to hear the other councilors' comments. Thank you very much. Jack. I would support uh, Councillor Mole's uh, recommendation with the caveat, I guess, that should the Pulaski proposal pass, that there's not going to be any dedicated funds, and that certainly would be one of the things that wouldn't stay in the budget. And I would certainly accept that as a friendly amendment because, you know, we are, we are tight for funds, but this, as Councillor Roberts mentioned back in May, is an event that really brings three times, four times the cost of the event in donations to the different town charitable groups that run it. This is their big fundraiser of the year. And to really help those groups run, col uh, collect donations at Family Fund Day, we really need to have a draw. And this fireworks display really helps make people stay in town for this event where all, and it's strictly a local charity group. You know, whether it's the Rotary Club or the Lions Club, uh, all the other organizations that come down. Uh, it would help us to attract more artists, local artists to the event. Uh, so something that could really, you know, because we'd like to do something to, to build the Family Fund Day back up again. Thank you. Councilor Lynch, I just have a question, I guess, for the manager. Um, and I apologize, Michael, if you explained it and I didn't quite understand, but where would the 10,000 would come from I see use of surplus succeeding year and Michael's pointing out to me yes. but I guess I want a clarification from the town manager on where the 10,000 will come from what line what account you, you would need to add it as, a, as an additional item under appropriated funds you would in, in essence be appropriating those funds the, it, the, the net effect of it would be 
to uh, otherwise would be reduced the surplus as of June 30 by two, uh, 2004 by $10,000. Mm -hmm. uh, an amount we still don't know what it is yet. The audit has just arrived today. Okay. So the use of the, the figure 210000 that's already been appropriated for the use for the following year. That, it needs that's to, what I thought. It needs to stay in place. So this 10000 actually doesn't come from anything on here. It's coming from the surplus line in our annual report. It, yeah. Yes, go when ahead. You, when you add up all the town revenues and you subtract from it all the expenditures, you come up with an amount you know, then you take all the reserves that, you know, for receivables, that type of thing. You come up with something called the undesignated surplus. And because this is $10,000, it wouldn't be lapsing into surplus. Uh, the $10,000 would be less uh, than uh, it would be impacting that amount. I, I would like to indicate that, you know, this past year there was a carry forward of 3750 The year before there was 6500 and, you know, in the 6500 was two years ago was intended to try to pay for the fireworks. Uh, and it, it wasn't quite enough. But Family Fund Day used to get an appropriation, as Councilor Mole said, up to about $13,000 a year. And as it hasn't gotten appropriations, uh, you know, the, the volunteers have really tried hard, but it, 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 uh, it does influence the ability to carry forward the day. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I think if the town, I'll, let me be a little more blunt. If the town doesn't do it, uh, Family Fun Day will probably die a, a, a death uh, a year or two from now, no matter how much the volunteers I understand that. need for. I'm still trying to figure out exactly where the 10000 comes from. So you're estimating how much in surplus revenue I, this year outside of the somewhat I think designated. We had, on the expenditure side, uh, probably overall netting out will be will be up a couple hundred thousand dollars, I think. Overall, what, what with expected? everything included. With, and with the major factor being the, the amount left from the overlay for last year. So we, our, we will be up from the previous year's surplus? Yes, approximately $200,000. And that's still, it's still early. A lot of factors went into that. So this would, in essence, take 5% of that interest. Further discussion? Well, I, I would just have the same caveat that Jack has, which is if Celeste passes, all bets are off and no one should read <coughs> any anything in the budget as a promise in stone. Councilor Backer. Um, Michael, who paid for the 4th of July fireworks? The City of Portland pays a lot of the expense of that day. Uh, they also do solicit private contributions, including we, we get a letter every year, we, we never contribute, but uh, <laughs> the Cape Elizabeth does not have 4th of July fireworks. But Symphony paid for their fireworks in July, whatever day it was. Out of and, and that's what I'm referring to, is the, the Symphony fireworks at Fort Williams. Yeah, paid for out of everyone's ticket cost through the Symphony, and the Symphony contracts for the fireworks. They're not municipal fireworks. Further discussion? Councilor Fritz. I mean, it does seem like there's a lot of fireworks right around that period of time. I mean, what, Family Sunday is around June, you know, June 20. Um, I, I think it's missing fireworks, the, the, the event is missing fireworks, but I mean it seems that this is, should be part of the budget discussion. When we were discussing the budget, we were weighing lots of things and saying, you know, balancing them off to setting priorities at that time. Um, and we made we made decisions in the last two years not to do that, and and I don't think this is really the time to be adding in items like this. It would be nice, but it's like one of those things that 
in the it would be nice column. It's not in the necessary column, and I think we're at that point when we need to do just the necessary thing. Council McGinty. That, that was my concern also that we're doing this outside the normal budget process. You know, this, these carry forward forward balances. I mean, this isn't like it's extra money, particularly appropriated funds. That money was appropriated to be spent on particular items um, or programs. Um, same with the donated funds. Those funds were donated to these particular funds um, for particular usage. Um, we discussed extensively on how much of the surplus, undesignated surplus to use in a regular budget process. Um, I think if the council wanted to take $10,000 out at that time, we should have done it during the regular budget process. Um, and we don't know at this point what the audited balance is going to be. Um, I have no doubt that Mike's probably pretty close to the mark on this, but um, I would, you know, I, I just, I hate doing these things outside the regular budget process, and that's, uh, you know, my position. Council Moll. <clears throat> well, as a matter of fact, we had actually discussed it in May, and we had discussed whether it should be in the regular budget or not, and we had discussed that when it was time to look at what we had for surplus funds that we would try to fund it out of that, which is why I'm, I've been waiting and we were bringing it up tonight, because that's what we had discussed in May. Uh, Thank you, Council Lynch. Uh, um, I, I recall that discussion, Michael. I think maybe at this point it's just still premature because we haven't closed and seen the end of this past fiscal year and that's what gives me a lot of uncomfort is we don't have all the bills and we haven't seen the financial statement but I certainly recall that we discussed we would look at it again uh, but I'm uncomfortable that it, we're a little bit premature looking at it tonight because tonight we have before us just carrying over those things that we had uh, appropriated and we didn't get to and we want to continue um, since the manager, if the manager were to come and say, well, I'm not going to do lines 001, 004, and 011, freeing up 10,000, I might feel differently, but I don't hear the manager saying that. So I guess I'd like to see what our financial statements look like for the close of the year. Any further comments? Council back? No. Well, I'm in the same camp as uh, Councillor Fritz and Councillor McGinty on this. It seems awfully easy with a pool of funds in front of us. It seems easy to me to say, yeah, let's carve out $10,000. But if we were to open up the availability of $10,000 to all the different department heads and ask them to give us a competing request and bid, we'd be back to our budget committee discussions. And we'd have the library telling us about uh, historic documents that are subject to rot for lack of a humidifier and a dozen other things that would be equally competing, and we'd be torn. So I also think that to consider it in the abstract um, creates sort of an unfair risk of favoring one town event project need over many others without an opportunity for others to vie for those same dollars. Thank you. No, I'm I just will make one comment. I believe also, don't we have on our agenda, our workshop agenda or something, discussion of how much the undesignated balance should be? Is that an upcoming issue? Yes. yes. So, so I mean, there's, future workshop. Yeah, so I mean, there's an issue of how much we should even have before we start spending it. You know. mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Just one quick comment. I, I would like to point out that there was $2,000 left in the Family Fund Day account, that is, as uh, Mike Moles mentioned, because of the frugality of the committee, was left unspent. And, uh, well, if, if there's $2,000 left in the account that was left unspent, why wouldn't that appear as a carryover on this list? Because that's an operating fund and not a 
not a capital fund, and operating funds generally lapse. However, they can be carried forward by the council. I'm, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I think in light of the budget process that goes on, where we try to balance all the different competing needs in town, um, all the different priorities. I love Family Fun Day. I try to go every year. I think it would be wonderful to have fireworks. But given all the other things we have had to cut in the last budget cycle, mm -hmm. and given all the restrictions we placed on the town manager and his department, and all the needs that were unmet, things like roads, and um, you know humidifiers for the library and many other things and all the cuts not cuts but all the the restrictions that the school uh, department felt that uh, they were operating under they were not able to meet some of the needs they wanted to even though they got a fairly large increase given all those factors and also given the fact that the Poleski referendum is coming up I think a I I will not be supporting this motion because A, I think it's too soon. We don't know what the money situation is at the moment. And secondly, I'm uncomfortable with taking things out of, things that are not of a true emergency nature out of the regular budget process because I like to be able to weigh them against uh, each other. So um, with that, I'd like to move the question um, so all those in favor of um, the motion to approve these balances except to take 10000 from somewhere to use to support Family Fund Day. All in favor? All in favor. Could you all in favor of Michael's motion. Pardon me? All in favor of Michael's motion. In favor of my motion. Okay. Well, I'm going to vote in favor of my vote. Yes, one. All opposed? Six. Okay. Thank you very much. Now we still need to deal with the carry forward balances. Um, do I hear another motion? Yes. I will move um, that um, the carry forward ba balances as put forth on this amended um, sheet that was before us tonight be authorized to be carried forward into FY 2005. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Six. Opposed? One. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next item is item number 29, the MMA officer ballot. Do I hear a motion? Councilor McGinty. I move that the uh, MMA ballot be cast as presented to us. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. The next item is item number 30, which was not in our packet but was emailed to us by Deborah Lane. It's a recommendation to fill a vacancy on the Thomas Memorial Library Trustees. Who's chair of appointment? Okay. Do I hear a motion? Yes, I would like to make a motion that we fill the vacancy on the Board of Trustees of the Thomas Memorial Library with uh, Nancy McGlynn. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Do I hear any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is item number 31, use of roadway drainage carry forward balance. Would the manager like to make 
a brief introduction? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. In the carry forward that you approved a few minutes ago, you were carried forward in the uh, roadway improvement account $73,364 and account seven fifteen four zero zero nine. This item proposes to use 65,530 of this for a drainage improvement uh, that is uh, working cooperatively with the, the city of South Portland on the removal of a combined overflow. Generally, we might take this out of the sewer fund rather than this fund, but since there's no money, virtually no money in the sewer fund, uh, that's this proposal. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second? Second. So moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I, a question. Councillor Beck. For our town manager, um, Michael, I'm sorry, would you tell me, say again, they've, I think you just said that I was reading and I think it, yeah. I, I didn't hear it. But with regard to the carry forward balance that right. this is being allocated from? 715-4009 roadway improvements is $73,364 in the account. And this proposes to spend uh, six sevenths of that amount, roughly sixty-five thousand five hundred. And was that anticipated? It was anticipated a few minutes. Yes, it was. Oh, the, overall, it, it wasn't anticipated. This thing wasn't really anticipated, but well, you know, like so many things, we're stuck with a challenge of finding a way to pay for something. And, uh, you know, we, we would hope to be able to set aside those funds to. Uh, continue our paving program to continue to set them aside for some large projects. Uh, fortunately, we just did a project on Jewett Road that we worked cooperatively with uh, Leland P. Murray, Inc., or whatever they call themselves now, Skip Murray. That we, we, we used public works crews, we used uh, his crew in a time and materials base. And how much did we end up saving from the original estimate, Bob? We saved about 20000 so you know, that helped us to, in part, find some of this money. Did that answer your question, David? Yes, no, it's yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Fritz, did you have a question? Or a I'm just wondering, since ordinarily this would come from the sewer fund, once that sewer fund is replenished, would the general fund then be reimbursed? No, because even with <laughs> the sewer rate increase, you look at the sewer fund and it's, it's four years before it gets any balance. <coughs> yeah, and I, if I may, Councilor because Rich. I was going to... Uh, raised something, Michael, when you said that ordinarily this would come from the sewer fund. Um, this is largely, as I read the letter, dealing with storm water. And so I think there's an argument to be made that it ought not to necessarily come from the sewer fund, which is funded by sewer users because it's a larger townwide issue when you're dealing with storm water. That's why it was proposed this way here. So I think it makes a lot of sense, but I, I, I don't want to leave the impression with the public, particularly the folks who are paying their sewer bills, um, that it should be just a sewer issue. It, it really is a town issue. And so I don't think we're raiding the sewer fund necessarily when we're dealing with stormwater issues. Thank you, right. Councilor Ross. I guess for just for purposes of the public is listening, uh, a lot of people may not know where Trout Brook is, and Trout Brook comes from Jake's Ponds up in, in South Portland, the public park up there, the Green Belt area, and it comes down across Ocean Street and then feeds down behind uh, Memorial Middle School and heads into, Mil into Mill Cove. Um, you may notice that the stream, it uh, floods quite often, it's quite muddy and murky by the Mormon Church. so. It's a, a valuable wetland area, and it would be good, I think, to help get that cleaned up. It's, it is not a very user-friendly uh, stream for the poor fish trying to live in it. And whatever we can do to help, I think, would be appreciated by all. I wonder if there's alewives somewhere. Oh, sorry. Did you see that was the alewives running? I went down, and the alewives were actually running a few weeks ago. By the hundreds, I jumping in and out stunned. of the brook. Were they running or swimming? Huh? Were they running or swimming? Well, they were mostly feed for the seagulls, but they were they were jumping out of the brook into the ocean, and about one out of every we should have, two was making it. We should have had a resolution hours. celebrating that day. <laughs> I can't believe it. It was on Family Fun Day, as a matter of fact. Oh, geez. Oh. I should have known. Okay. Um, 
It was celebrated. They were celebrating. <laughs> well, Family fun day. We could have ale wives instead of fireworks, I guess. Um, okay. I think I'm getting a little giddy <laughs> here. Sorry. Um, so, have we had a motion? <laughs> yes, it's been moved mm -hmm. and seconded. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Thank you. It's unanimous. I'm going to hold my Okay, next item. Item number 32, proposed charter amendment. And this has to do with a charter amendment to move the May municipal election to November. Would the town clerk or the town manager like to say anything about this? I met with the uh, town attorney uh, last week, and uh, there's a pretty hefty packet here. Um, but basically, um, we begin with the municipal officers determining that there needs to be an amendment to the charter. And if so, then we need to um, do a public notice at least seven days prior to the meeting. And um, the notice, uh, after, after the notice and the public hearing within seven days, the uh, council would charge the <coughs> municipal clerk uh, to place it on the ballot. And that could be done at the same meeting, at the next meeting. So uh, on the third page, basically it's changing the municipal election from May to November, clarifying the induction date for the new town council members and school board members as a result of the change of the election date, uh, providing for extensions of terms of existing town council members and school board members. And basically the proposed amendment is, is that the term on each, um, each be extended to December. Changing the deadline to file nomination papers from 45 days to 60 days prior to the election, and then also providing for a, a, an objection time frame period. There's two days that's provided in the statute. And the 45 to 60 day proposal is basically uh, in, is a suggestion that I ask for in order to be able to prepare ballots and have them back. Um, within 45 days uh, with the state ballots to have them at the same time um, to do absentee voting. And so I think it's pretty explanatory as far as the amendments and an explanation under each and what each of those do. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? For Councilor Fitz. To explain why I'm, I mean, I, I'm voting against having a public hearing. I have just been a long supporter of having the municipal elections being as important as they are for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth in their everyday life. That the candidates for council and school board need to have, um, I think, a separate time when when people consider those candidates rather than to be lost in the election of November. And I think indeed they would be lost. Um, so I don't favor the move to November from there. Okay. Council McGinty. Likewise, I don't favor the move, however, I'm going to vote to send this to public hearing. Um, although I agree with Carol that I, I don't support the change at this time at least. Any further discussion or comments? No? Uh, oh, well, I'm sorry, Councilor. Just, just um, so the public is make sure that we're abundantly clear, we're sending this to the public hearing, and should we adopt it ourselves, it will go to the voters in November. And what we're really saying, and what we're really asking, is, do the people in this? We're asking whether the residents in this town would like to vote in November and for town councilors and school board members. So we're giving them the choice and um, I certainly will be supporting I support it because of the simple turnout issue but more importantly I support giving our town residents the choice Councilor Mould in case the public is wondering why this even came up um, this this came up out of a discussion on cost saving measures for the town and looking for ways that we can save a little bit of money as well as serve the public better with the turnout issue. Uh, what was our turnout this 
May, it was in the four to 500 range, 572. Um, certainly not a good representative, you know, sampling of Cape residents. And, you know, we would, we would like to see our school board and councilmen and councilwomen elected with good representation from all the citizens of the town. So we would like to invite the public to come down and give us their opinion. Any further discussion or comment? Okay, all those in favor of setting a public hearing for August 9th, um, 2004, with regard to the issue of moving of the May election to November, all in favor? Six, opposed, one. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the citizens, the second opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. Is there anyone out there who would like to do that? Seeing none, um, before we adjourn, I would just like to mention that we're having a brief workshop at, after this meeting um, where we will just get a brief update on the um, efforts of the Tax Cap Task Force um, and also hear a little information about uh, South Portland's efforts um, with regard to a charter change. And uh, that's it. We won't be making any decisions, obviously, because it's a workshop. So, uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. And moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much.